Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Entering in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. The angel said to her, this is where our doctrinal lesson comes from tonight. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call him Jesus. Now, in Matthew 121, he explains to it is explained to Joseph in that story why they're going to call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 121. That is not declared here, but it is declared in Matthew. Behold, which is very important to Mary, the word behold. Behold, you will conceive. This, this, when he says that to Mary, he's saying, you better highlight this. This is really important. This is coming down the pike in your life. This is the big deal. Behold, verse 31, you will conceive in your womb. You will bear a son. You will call him Jesus. Next, he will be great. He will be called of the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel responded and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High Who is the Most High? Verse 32. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. We don't have to guess. It's explained. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason, the holy offspring child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, is that important? Yes. Second one we've had from Gabriel's explanation. Yeah, this is dynamite to her life in practical application of what Gabriel is teaching her. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. By that they mean past menopause. And she who was called barren, because she had it so long, all the way through her productive years, she was identified barren. Now she's in menopause. Who was called barren in her productive years is now in her sixth month of pregnancy, which is a key, isn't it, ladies? The sixth month is a key. And so they identify that. Then he, he gives her a standard, important doctrinal principle in dealing with the will of God in your life. Sometimes the will of God in your life comes out and works really easy because it fits into the pattern of your life. Sometimes the will of God hits your life and it's so out of your normal pattern of comfort zone that it just shakes your world. This is going to shake her world. And he says to her, nothing for nothing will be impossible with God. You've got to understand that. And what does that mean? Nothing will be impossible with God. It means according to his will. I can't tell you how important it is. We know nothing's impossible with God. If you understand anything about God, you go, like, well, that makes sense. Mm-mm. This impossible is in your life, not in his. Now, 
nothing is impossible in your life. When God puts his word on your soul, nothing is impossible in your life for God not to complete that. Romans 4.21. We know there is nothing impossible with God. Right? It's not what he's saying here. He is saying, for nothing be, will be impossible in your life according to the will of God. He says it about prayer in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. And if you know he hears you, you know you have the request. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God. And he used Elizabeth as an example to her of having a baby while a virgin. Elizabeth went through, God held her off through her, all of her productive years, barren. She went into menopause, pregnant, six months into her pregnancy. You've got to understand, Mary, that nothing, when God lays his word on you as a direct of will, nothing is impossible with God. She asked the question, how can this possibly be? I'm a virgin. I'm engaged to be married. I am not married. I'm engaged to be married. How is this possible? And it was going to, she understood what he meant. It's going to happen before you get married. How is that going to be possible? He said, well, I explained it, but I understand it's full of a whole lot of stuff. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I understand. That's just what, what does that mean? <laughs> Wouldn't we all feel that way? What in the world does that mean? Well, it means this is how I'm going to get you pregnant, Mary. <laughs> I... God is going to do it all, Mary. You're going to do none of it. I need, a, I need you to be willing, to be obedient, to be willing to be part of this program. Do you understand that? And she goes, well, how is this possible? And he said, I'll tell you how it's possible. With God, nothing's impossible. Isn't that wonderful to know that? You see, there's so many things that we face in our life that seem to be impossible. When God says, gives you a promise from his word, it is no longer impossible, it is possible. That's why you walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 38, did Mary get it? She got it. What's the first word? What's the first word? Behold. Gabriel's used it twice with her, and she understood how important it was to the will of God. Behold the will of God. Behold the will of God. Nothing's impossible with God. So you come to church, and you hear that, and you walk away, and then you struggle, and you complain, and you fret, and you frown, and you do all those things. You ought to say to yourself, like, nothing's impossible with God. I'm going to hang with him. Everything else is impossible. Why not hang with him where nothing is impossible? Everything in your life is impossible. <laughs> they can shut your program down so quick it make your head spin. She uses the word back. Isn't that interesting? Three times this word was two times to her, and she understood it, and she, she gave it back. She's been, she said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. There's, listen, you're going to be a bond slave of something. It's either the world or the Lord. Nobody's not. Everybody's a bond slave to something. Bond slave to your sin nature. Huh? You ought to read Romans 6. There it is. You know how you know when you're a bond slave? Because every time you get in stress, you blow out. You never blow in. 
You never, breathe, you never breathe in the Word of God. You blow out anger and disappointment and disgust. That's when you know who you're a bond slave of, whether it's of the world and the flesh or whether it's of the Lord. It's how you react to stress. How come you don't know that? How is it possible you don't understand that? Hmm? Well, we're going to explain it to you today. We're going to help you climb out of that hole you've put yourself in. Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of whom? The Lord. That's where impossible things become possible. When you become a bond slave to the word of God. You don't let things and people and things distract you from pure devotion to Christ. Verse 38, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Watch this. Be it done according to your word. And the angel departs. Why? Mary can handle it. Mary can handle it because she responded with the behold. I heard you two beholds. She salutes and says, I'm ready to take charge. Boy, I'll tell you. This is going to be what kind of a Christmas you're going to have. Listen, God can turn your life around on a dime. You got a dime? Huh? Uh, got a dime? Uh, turn your heart around, turn your life around. I got one I can give you. And I got 55, 65 cents. I can get 10 people in here, I can give you a dime. Now, if this was teenagers, I'd have to give them away. I've done that before. They wanted their dollar afterwards. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll study this morning what we just read. All I did was read it. Now we're going to study it. And I'm going to tell you this morning, listen to me, I'm going to tell you that the Lord will pull you out of the pit Whatever pit you have dug and put yourself in, the Lord will pull you out like he did Joseph. And he will turn your life loose and set you free. And he will do such marvelous things in your life that a year from now you will stagger over what the power of God can do in your life. And that's my prayer for you this Christmas. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. We're going to learn a great deal about that today. You can't study it nor live it in carnality. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. Make confession. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, whatever it is, he is faithful and just to forgive me, and the blood of Christ cleanses me and restores me to spirituality, not salvation, spirituality of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is a key to spiritual living, especially Bible study, where it becomes the learning part to your life. You have to learn it to apply it. Faith comes by hearing and then the application. And so, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and the Internet. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our lesson tonight is going to look at four aspects of, of the doctrinal study that Gabriel gave Mary. His great lesson is based on the question she asked. The great theology of it is based on the question, how can this happen? I don't. I'm not doubting that this could happen, but how can it happen to a virgin? I am not married. I'm engaged, which is an interesting concept in the scriptures here, which we'll talk about in a moment. How can this be since I'm a virgin? Now, this might not seem like a big deal to you, but it was a big deal to Joseph when he learned about it. She went off. She got pregnant. She went off for three months, and when she came back visiting Elizabeth, she was three months pregnant. 
Elizabeth was in her sixth month when, it, when, when Mary went to visit her. Apparently, she returned after the birth of John the Baptist with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And she came home three months pregnant. Matthew, the first chapter of Matthew, Joseph really struggled with that. You could understand that. Gabriel showed up and gave him a Bible lesson. See, God is faithful to his plan, whether you are or not. 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 2.13, God is faithful even when we're not. Faithful to what? To his plan. What, what does he want from us? He wants us to be faithful to it too. That's where a lot of wonderful things happen in your life according to the will of God. And so, how can this be since I'm a virgin? It is interesting that everybody focuses on this, it's okay with me. Everybody focuses on the Hebrew and Greek words that are used here for virgin. They all mean the same thing, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. They mean that she is of age and has, is of age and condition for childbirth. And both, both words mean that. Both words mean that. She, she is of the right age and conditions to become married and have children. Joseph is probably the one that reveals a lot to us, along with Isaiah 7:14, "Behold, a virgin shall." But Mary gives you the real secret. She says, "I'm engaged. I am not married." And the one guy that knows about her virginity, one guy that for sure knows about it, is Joseph. Because as they say in baseball, he, he never got to first base. And we know it from him. That he is really, it, when she comes back three months pregnant, it rocks his world, as you could probably imagine. And here's what it says in Matthew 1.18, if you want to put that on your paper. Before they came together, before they came together, she was discovered to be with child. And it rocked his world. And he's going to learn the lesson about nothing is impossible with God. He's going to learn that lesson. And he's going to learn that it's all based on Isaiah 7:14, the prophecy of a virgin giving birth to the Messiah. I want to look at four things this morning about this idea. One, when you look closer, you will see that Gabriel's message was directed to three parties. A lot of times we don't pay attention to the characters unless it's on screen. Then we pay attention to characters. A lot of times, unless it's on the screen and they're actively, verbally in front of you, visibly, we don't pay any attention to characters. You should pay as much attention to characters in the Bible and what's going on in, in narratives as any movie you would ever go to. We tend not to do that, and I've discovered this over the years, and so I try to bring attention to that. And one of the things that people miss is the dynamics of what's going on here between three parties in, his, in Gabriel's message. Part of that message is to Mary. Part of it is about he, Christ. And the other part of it is about the Holy Spirit. Mary, Christ, the Holy Spirit. These are three persons. These are three parties. And so I listed them for you because sometimes we miss that and we don't see the dynamics of it because it's not visual. And we, when you read the Bible, you should get visible. You ought to get visionary with it. You ought to lay back and try to picture it. It will help you understand the characters and the dynamics of what's going on in a narrative. This is a narrative. So, I laid them out for you. For example, five times there, Mary's involved. She's involved in 28, 29. Actually, it goes way back to 26. 
actually 26 through 29, where in the sixth month, Gabriel shows up in a city, yada, yada, yada. And then in verse 30, Mary, you found favor with God. In verse 31, you will conceive, you will bear a son, we'll call his name Jesus. In verse 34, Mary asks a very important question. How can this possibly happen? I'm a virgin. And so it come, he, then, it, then he goes to the, a different doctrinal level, which involves the child and the Holy Spirit. And then he comes back to Mary in 38, where Mary responds. The, his whole visit is, are you going to accept this or reject it? When she accepts it, what's he do? When she accepts it in verse 38, what's the last part of verse 38 say? He leaves. Why? The deal's been sealed. She responded in a positive way to the, to the directive will of God. She salutes, and he leaves. Mission accomplished. Mary took her positive volition, put it in the plan of God, activated it by faith, and she's ready to go. Now, when you look at the, the holy child, you're in verse 32. In verse 31, Mary, you will conceive. Verse 32 and verse 33, it's about him. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Do you see how dynamic the he and the his is? Well, look, at just count them. He will be great, one. He will be called two. And the Lord will give him three. His father, David, five. He will reign over the house of Jacob, six, seven, right? I don't know. I lost count in there, but somewhere. <laughs> My point is, notice the word he and his. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about the Son of God whose name is going to be, earthly name is going to be Jesus because his doctrinal divine name is Christ. And what he is called is the Son of God. His prophetic name is Christ. His physical name or earthly name is Jesus. He's called Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's Emmanuel. He's the Son of God living with us. Living among us, Emmanuel, God among us. And so there's a great doctrinal thing here. Seven times he's taken the word he and he's pounded the theology of it. And there's a whole lesson here about who Christ is. There's seven points given about him. And they've got to fulfill doctrine. They've got to fulfill Old Testament scripture. And there's this wonderful study just in that by itself. And then the Holy Spirit. I want to give you three. I should have separated 36 and 37. So when you get to the Holy Spirit, would you put a 137 on it? Because there are three. In verse 35, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. We know who the Most High is because he's explained that earlier. Will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Offspring shall be called the Son of God. Verse 35. Verse 35, he gives you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. One. Two. The power of the Most High, that's God, will overshadow you. Three. And for that reason, the Holy Offspring will be called the Son of God. You see those three things? Now, in verse 36... He hasn't stopped in his discussion. He gives a behold, right? He did that in 31. Now he does it in 36. Behold, even your, your relative Elizabeth also conceived a son in her old age, and she was called barren, who is now in her sixth month. Now. And Mary's going to go visit her. And she's going to be, 
She's going to get saved before she goes. Verse 37, he says, for nothing will be impossible with God. All right? All of that's contained in the Holy Spirit, the Holy, what the Holy Spirit's going to do and what your response needs to be. And, of course, then Mary. In verse 38. See, for me, I'm just telling you how I study. I'm not telling you how you have to. But I'm going to tell you how I have to study so I can set back and I can get every bit of that out of the scripture. So for me, it's like a TV program for me. It's something that catches my attention and I like to watch. Now pay attention. You, the main characters are very important and what's going on with it is the whole dynamics of it. And he's giving her a preview of coming attractions that's going to really turn her world upside down. And she understands it when she salutes and says, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. That's a pretty, pretty powerful idea. That's the way we all should live. You know that. Do you know what Mary's going, listen to me, what Mary's going through is normal spiritual maturity living? This is not absurd. This is not crazy. This is normal. Now, I don't know that you're going to be in menopause and get pregnant tonight. <clears throat> I don't mean that, but I do mean this, that a lot of things in your life, as you go through it, get your furniture gets changed. What I call your life, some major changes happened in your life you had never expected, and you've been prepared for it, too. If you, if you go to this church, you've been prepared for it, whether you take, pay attention to it or not. Listen, Gabriel comes and teaches whether you believe it or not. The lessons there. Now I can't, I can teach it to you, but I can't make you believe it. You would be wise to, but I can't make that. Listen, nothing is impossible with God if it's according to His Word. Right? Mary, Mary understood that. May it be done to me according to your word. That's the key. Point number two. Having now looked at the passage we're after and broken it down and gotten a good view of it, now we will examine Gabriel's doctrinal lesson to Mary by four homiletical points. I want you to see this now. Now we come down to what Mary's going to have to really believe and apply to her life. First, the Holy, the Holy Spirit conception and the child's divine name. I switched this verse around in verse 35. I took the last phrase and put it first. Because that's where people struggle. So I put it first. For that reason, the holy child shall be called the son of God. Now, here's why he did that. Now, listen to me, because this is what you miss at Bible study. This is what you miss. You get way too theological and student and miss the concepts. The word of God is to be applied. And that's Mary's testimony to you. The word of God that comes to you in class has got to be applied in the real living time experience by faith. So I switch that around for you to grasp the importance of Bible doctrine to your personal experience of your life. For that reason, the holy child will be called the son of God. Now the question would be, for what reason? Would that be fair? Yeah. For what reason? And here's the answer. You see, the answer is always before the question. Even though the question may be there, the answer has already been given to you by the word of God. For what reason? For that reason, the holy child will be called the son of God. For what reason? 
would the child that marries to be called the son of God? Here's the reason. First, it's based on two things, two facts. First, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Two, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Right? And for that reason, and for that, do you, are, you, are you looking at verse 35? And for that reason, what is the reason is twofold. Would you agree? The reason is twofold. It's twofold. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High, what would be the power of the Most High? In the essence of God, what would we call that? Omnipotence. When omnipotence is called into play, the impossible is called a miracle. Let that sink in, because the Bible's full of them. The ten plagues in Egypt, the Red Sea, and the list goes on. It's true in your life. Romans 4.21. What God has promised, he is able to perform it out in your life by your faith, not by your sight. The second thing that's important in the doctrinal statement given to Mary that's going to cause her to be able to be stable when her, world gets when her world gets turned upside down, she's going to be able to stay stable. And boy, is her world going to get turned upside down or right side up, according to the Word of God, is the holy appointment. The holy appointment. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and this is going to happen. And Elizabeth is an example that the power of God always is working not only ahead of it, but in the now of it. Not in just the prophecy of it, not in just the word about it, but in the actual now living of it. Now Elizabeth is in her sixth month. Right? I say, I love that now word. And this is going to happen in your life, Mary. I am preparing you by the word of what's going to come. If you accept this, there's going to be some things going. And I want you to know why they're, what your stability is going to be during this period is going to be your stay focused on the directive will of God that I have declared to your life. Stay focused on the directive will. That's your stabilizer in a changing world that's going to come because you accept the will of God for your life. See, I think sometimes we don't even pay attention to it. Maybe that's a good thing. If when your world gets turned around and God begins to move your chairs, your furniture around in your life, rearranging your life, if you're, if you're steady and compatible with God doing that in your life, I'm a bond slave, he can do with it. I don't own anything. If he wants to change my life, change my life but change it according to your word, and I can see what's going on, and that's the way he operates. A holy appointment, Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, verse 1 and 2. There's an appointed time for every event in your life. There's an appointed time for every event of your life. There's an appointed time for every event of your life. Therefore, quit fighting it when these events come to your life. It's by appointment, and it's, it's never greater than your capacity to deal with it in the Word of God by faith. Never. So a Bible study is so important. And so he talks about two miraculous conceptions. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. You know why? Because God's faithful to his word. Mary is just on the front stage. She's on the conception stage. She says she's still got three months and six months and nine months. 
before she gets to the baby deal. And boy, is she going to have something. When she goes home three months pregnant, it's found out to be three months pregnant. Listen, Joseph's not only going to be a problem. We got two families because it says when she's engaged, she's in the perfect tense. Uh, <laughs> the word gauge means she's, the word gauge is a perfect passive participle, the word engaged. You know what engaged means? It means that both families have agreed to this, to this couple being married, and they have gone through a formal cel uh, uh, celebration of commitment of engagement. It means that they're already, they have already been in deep planning stages of the wedding, where we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, who the bridemaids, yada, yada, yada. The place has been picked. The invitations have been sent out, and we now have a date and a time and a place. <clears throat> Sometime after three months from now, when she comes home from visiting Elizabeth, they're going to get hitched. Everything is done, and she goes to visit three months before it. That's the perfect tense of something completed. Boy, is that all going to change when she gets home. As far as the test. The third thing that he talks about to me is a holy ageless truth. Here is a holy, divine, ageless truth. And don't miss that this morning. If you get nothing else, get this, because this will this will hold your head above water. For nothing is impossible with God when it's according to his word. See, Mary added that last part to you, didn't she? Well, what did Mary say in verse 38? May it what? Be what? Done. Done. <laughs> May it be done according to your word. May it be done. You know, the first place is done is in your soul and then in your life. The first place it's done is in your soul by faith. And then you walk it out in real time. She salutes and is ready to march it out. Nothing will be impossible with God. Boy, you need to hang on that, baby. And here's the final one, in my opinion, the holy words of faith. Here are the holy words of faith. Real time. Real time. Not I hope I have the courage to be this person. This is the person that steps up and says, salutes and says, I got it. I got it. I got it. Behold. That word behold when it comes from Mary means I understand, I believe what is asked of me. The first to behold, set it up. Behold, Mary. Behold, Mary. Mary says, got it. Behold, when she says, behold, the bond slave means I understand it. I believe it. I believe, I understand, and I believe what you are asking from me. Because that's going to be the great challenge in your life. And the Lord is her master, her bond slave. You know how important that is? Write these two verses down if you're married. If you want to be married. <laughs> if somewhere out there, Prince Charming rides up on that big white horse and sweeps you off your feet, this is for you. If he already has... Now he's the tin soldier. 
These verses are for you. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. And 1 Peter 3, 6. Pay attention to your mate as your Lord with a little L. Because the big L, Lord, is the Lord who asks you to be under the authority of a little L. Yeah, uh uh-huh, I see. Point three, when Gabriel presented God's directive will to Mary, he revealed three important functional categories. I said classifications, I'd rather have you call them categories. Because we have three classifications, directive will, permissive will, and overruling will of God. I don't want you to confuse it, so let's stay with categories. Functional categories. I want you to think, anytime God gives you a directive will, there are three things that have to line up for it to be functional. The directive will of God is always going to have these three, these three categories of functional part. There's going to be a ge- geographical will of God, a mental will of God, and an operational will of God, and we can see it here. For example, here's the geographical will of God. Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. That is the res- listen to me now, that is the residence, not the birthplace of Christ. It is the residence of Mary, not the birthplace of Christ. What's the, what's the name of the birthplace of Christ? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. What, what was the residence name? Nazarene, Nazareth. Because Bethlehem is prophetic. It's the birthplace of Christ. There is always a geograph- a right geographical place, a right geographical place. And your birth, listen to me, this is important, Merry Christmas people. Your birth certificate is going to be based on where you were born. For example, my residence was in Stony Lake, Michigan, but I was born in Whitehall, therefore my birth says I was born in Whitehall. My birth certificate says I was born in Whitehall. Whitehall, Michigan. Never lived in Whitehall, Michigan. And the longest I can remember ever staying in Whitehall, Michigan is when we played them in football because they were one of our rivals. And the birthplace of Christ is going to be Bethlehem. And they got it all confused later in his life. Well, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How about Bethlehem? Could any good thing come out of Bethlehem? Oh, yeah, everything good comes out of Bethlehem. Nothing comes out. Okay, he wasn't born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. Look up his birth certificate. Well, anyhow, the mental will of God to a virgin engaged. I told you this is a perfect Passive participle. I explain that to you. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descent of David and the virgin's name was Mary. That word engaged, she was totally involved in her wedding, had it all laid out in the perfect tense when she took three months off. And when she comes back, she's going to get married. Except when she comes back, she's three months pregnant and 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 Joseph says, time out. (laughs) Time out. Time out. Operational will of God. The operational will of God. She's called the favored one by God. The Lord is with you. You know what I call that? In military terms, that's a field promotion. Mary had no idea that she was a favored one, which is a spiritual mature status of super grace. 2 Thessalonians 1.3. Super grace is described a greater faith. A greater faith. Uh, I think in the New American, it call, the New American Standard, it call, says faith greatly enlarged. <laughs> a faith greatly enlarged. 
Now, if that's a tumor, we'd be worried. Favored one. Favored one. Operation Will of God. She was given a field promotion. She was shocked to hear that she was categorized among the favored ones of God. A status. The Lord is with you. And then she winds up this whole deal with the bond slave of the Lord. See, she understood, favored one, the Lord is with you. Bond slave of the Lord may be done to me, to me according to your word. Operational will. She was getting a field promotion, or she was worthy of it at the end, because when she saluted and said, I understand it, I accept the challenge, and I'm into it. I'm in. She salutes. And he leaves, mission completed. Point number four, in closing. Gabriel explained to Mary that the holy child, listen to me now, listen very closely to me, would have two fathers and neither of them would be Joseph. In the passage I read to you this morning, if you were a lurk, you know the two fathers mentioned. And I'm not going to tell you, because you should be alert. We read it. I read this passage and explained it to you two or three times. But I wrote it on your paper. I spoil you people. I spoil you. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, we know who that is because it's already explained to us in verse 32 that that's God. And the Lord will give him the throne of what? His father David. These are scriptural, biblical fathers, messianic fathers. These are messianic fathers. Of course, God isn't, but David is. God, Messianic fathers. In Acts, the second chapter, verse 33, at Pentecost, this is stated. Therefore, having exalted to the right hand of God, here's what we know, seated on the throne, whose throne is that? God in heaven, the one in heaven. You know, he's raised from the dead 40 days and then ascends back, ascension, ascends back to the seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, on his throne. And when that deal is over, he's going to leave the throne. He's going to come back and do the whole tribulational eschatology business, and the Father's going to take his throne back. Did you know that? And when he talks about the throne of David, he's talking about the millennial kingdom. And the throne he's sitting on right now is the Father's throne. It's not David's throne. It's God's throne. It's the most high throne that he's sitting on. You can study more of it in Hebrews 1 and 8 as I left information on your page. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, there are a lot of information there for us, people. A lot of information for us. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. What a faithful servant Gabriel was for the Messiah message. All over the birth story of Jesus Christ, it is Gabriel who comes and teaches and brings to light the prophetic teachings of Christ of the old covenant and connects all the different covenants like the Abraham and the Noahic and everything is connected, all the covenants, the great covenants down to the new covenant, all connected as he teaches and brings the message to the reality of the, of the generation of time, the now people, those who are living now. And here we are, Father, 
We are the now people. I pray, Father, that we would understand that we walk by faith according to your word, that we would have the good sense as Mary did out of our capacity to salute and say, the capacity I have, I believe you will complete it in my life. And I pray to have greater capacity for greater things in the plan of God. For it's all based on our capacity. We move from a baby believer to an immature believer to a mature believer in the plan of God. Greater things than these shall, he, shall be revealed to us. Greater things than these shall be revealed to us. We live to live in that day in the reality of the now, Father. We can't do it without cycling, inhale and exhale, both in the learning part and the living part of the word of God. Mary is proving that. One part of her is inhaling, the X part is exhaling. Inhale, exhale. That's how it's developed. I pray for that for our congregation, Father, as we begin our, our, our Christmas series. May we find reality to our life this Christmas in Jesus' name. Amen.